Hi, everyone, virtually from the National Conservation Training Center. My name is Philip Liu, and I am happy to host setting habitat protection and restoration priorities in a warming world lessons from Wyoming that is going to be given by Paul Day and Molly Cross. So without further ado, I will give it to Laura Thompson to present our presenters. Thanks, Philip. So we're happy to have here with us today, uh, Mr. Paul Day. He's the Aquatic Habitat Program Manager for the Wyoming Game and Fish Department. In this role, he facilitates a team of 12 agency biologists implementing stream restoration, fish passage, and water management projects to improve stream functions and aquatic resources. Also, uh, Dr. Molly Cross is a climate change adaptation scientist with the Wildlife Conservation Society. Her work brings together researchers and conservation practitioners to incorporate climate change science into on the ground conservation goals and actions. She is also a director of science for the WCS Climate uh, Adaptation Fund, which supports applied projects demonstrating effective interventions for wildlife adaptation to climate change in the United States. Paul and Molly, we're both delighted to have you both with us today. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks, Laura, for the introduction, and thanks so much for the invitation to present here today. Uh, it's a real honor to be co-presenting this uh, about this project with Paul. Um, he and I have had a great chance to work together over the last year and a half or so on this project, and it's exciting to be able to share it with um, some folks outside of our close circle. I'm really glad that you will get to hear directly from Paul himself, since I think sometimes hearing it from the end user's perspective of kind of how we collaborate and how we bring climate information into management planning is uh, especially useful. I'm gonna start off with a bit of an introduction and background of the project. This work was funded by the North Central Climate Adaptation Science Center or the North Central CASC as we sometimes call it. And it was really driven by their interest in supporting actionable climate science. Climate science and research and planning that can be directly applied in management decisions. And so as part of that, the North Central CASC wanted to better understand some timely climate science needs for upcoming decision-making by state and fish and wild, state fish and wildlife managers in the region, which um, for those who aren't familiar with it, the North Central region includes Montana, Wyoming, Colorado, the Dakotas, Nebraska, and Kansas. So the first phase of this project um, involved a series of interviews that were led by my colleague, Dr. Shelley Crosby at Conservation Science Partners, um, from which, uh, where she interviewed state fish and wildlife managers in the region. And that helped us hone in on some topics of shared interest across the region, which included climate change impacts on river and riparian ecosystems, as well as some specific upcoming planning and decision-making opportunities that we could support in the second phase of this project. And so that's where we made the connection with Paul and his team at the Wyoming Game and Fish Department around their interest in bringing climate change into their update of their statewide habitat plan. Paul's gonna talk more in a minute about that, but I just wanna kind of start off by saying that in this sort of second phase of the project and our collaborative work, we came into it with sort of three main goals, to work closely with the Wyoming Game and Fish Department to help them bring available climate information and help them co-produce climate related information that they could use in their upcoming plan update, while at the same time identifying management relevant or what we sometimes call sort of salient climate information gaps that could be filled through future research, some of which could be supported, for example, by the North Central CASC as well as others. And then lastly, the other, the third goal of the project was to learn about this process of co-producing usable climate information by documenting and evaluating our activities so that we can share that learning with others. So that brings us here to this presentation, our first attempt at sharing some of what we've been doing with a little bit of a wider audience. So I'm gonna turn it over now to Paul to talk about the sort of management planning opportunity that we focused on, the Wyoming Statewide Habitat Plan. And just to kind of emphasize that, again, when it comes to trying to produce climate information that's really usable, 
it's really critical to come at the question from the perspective of how might that information be used. So it's really important that the slide number two in our presentation here is focused on the planning process and how the agency uses that plan and decision making. So Paul, I'll take it away. Yeah, so this collaboration opportunity really came about for us at Wyoming Game and Fish Department at a perfect time. We were just beginning to plan an update to one of our department's most used and relevant plans, uh, our statewide habitat plan. This plan, we call it, we call it the SHIP or the SHP, outlines priorities for habitat protection and restoration. And as our group discussed our impending plan revision, we talked about how our new plan would need to address climate change to be relevant. And so the timing was really good when we heard from both the North Central Climate Adaptation Science Center and Molly at the Wildlife Conservation Society. And frankly, the facilitation provided by Molly really helped us on a huge part of, of the new plan. Um, the revision included a lot of other aspects that, that are not related to climate change that we're not gonna um, get into today, but a little bit of background, I guess, on our plan and planning process. Um, we had our first habitat plan, SHP, back in 2001, and it was motivated primarily by a need to get different sections and divisions from throughout our agency to work together better. We had folks going a lot of different directions, sometimes completely unaware of other work, kind of the, the silo thing you often see in agencies, I guess. So the plan provided a means to, um, in, in the process of putting it together, a plan as much as anything, a means to get everyone pulling together. And its implementation was successful enough that we've been updating it ever since. Um, and when I say we, I should note that an important aspect of this plan is the fact that we have a team of managers and, 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 and representatives from different parts of the agency. Uh, we call it the Habitat Technical Advisory Team. Of course, we have an acronym, HTAG. And, and this team is really responsible for the implementation. Team members oversee different programs, so they have the ability to see that the plan elements are actually tackled. And so this team was responsible for creating the new plan, um, but, but really who's responsible, the, these plans are, are tried, tried to be built from the ground up with input from everybody uh, from throughout the agency and the field especially. So finally, I should point out um, that the plan is a parallel plan, plan to our state wildlife action plan. Um, one might ask why we even have two plans, why not just have a swap? And we've certainly debated that question internally, but we keep coming down on the side of keeping both plans. Um, first off, our staff and biologists are comfortable and familiar with the ship. It preceded our swap, as a matter of fact, and it has a track record of being useful. Um, it, it's also free of federal expectations. Um, the swap is very comprehensive, as you all know, and, and although portions overlap our, our habitat plan, a swap covers a lot of other issues and species related information. So the ship is just a really kind of useful pragmatic plan that a lot of folks refer to and actually use. So we have both. Um, I guess with that background, Molly, I'll turn it back over to you to, uh, to dig in. So as we got started in this collaboration, the very first thing we did and in line with recommendations from the field of, sort of co-production of actionable science information, is we sat down and we laid out our shared goals for the work. And so with a particular emphasis on what the agency wanted to get out of this. And we just thought it was a useful process to all be on the same page and really transparent about what we wanted to accomplish together. And so um, along the way throughout the presentation, I'll say a little bit more about kind of the methods we used since part of this goal of this project was to document and share and what we learned in our methods. So I conducted one-on-one -on -one interviews with a core team of six managers at the Wyoming Game and Fish Department who were sort of the core team tasked with leading the 2020 update of the statewide habitat plan. And then we came together as a group to talk about kind of what I heard in those interviews. And this is a bit of a boiled down list of the goals we had for this project. Um, the agency wanted to help increase the knowledge amongst its staff on climate change impacts, 
climate informed planning tools and actions, as well as build some better relationships with relevant climate change experts. Um, obviously, a major goal of the project was to incorporate climate informed actions into the statewide habitat plan. Um, but then also sort of look ahead to what are some really important management relevant gaps in climate information that could be the subject of future research and ultimately help inform future decisions by the agency. And then lastly, as I said before, we wanted to be able to advance our learning on some of these methods for linking climate information with natural resource management decision making. So again, in terms of the steps of the project and a little bit more about the methods we used along the way, um, the first part of the project was spent mostly on my end, trying to learn more about the decisions and the decision context for the agency. So I reviewed previous versions of the statewide habitat plan and again, had lots of conversations with that core team at the department to better understand the plan, what kinds of information typically go into those plans to then be thinking about how climate change could be relevant. We worked with a scientist, Dr. Imtiaz Rangwala at the North Central Climate Adaptation Science Center um, to, to synthesize the available climate projections that were sort of tailored to be directly relevant to the state and the agency as they were thinking about this. And then we had a step where we were trying to co-produce these climate informed actions that were relevant for the statewide habitat plan that they, again, that the agent information that the agencies could, the agency could use in there planning process, the update. And we primarily accomplished this through a participatory climate change planning workshop involving staff at the agency and external climate change researchers. Um, but that wasn't all. We had to have lots and lots of meetings with the core team at the Wyoming Game and Fish Department and myself to um, kind of digest and translate the material that came out of that workshop to really bring it and make it useful to the plan. And we'll talk a bit more about that in the next few slides. In terms of identifying these longer term information gaps and needs, we utilized time at the workshop to focus on that. But we also followed up with an online survey to, to better understand priorities. And then lastly, we tried to really learn about the project as we went. And we did that and evaluated our methods and, and our activities and the ultimate outcomes of the work through surveys, as well as some semi-structured interviews at the end of the project. So for those of you that like to know some of the how we do this work, um, again, along the way, I'll talk a bit more about sort of what we did, as well as what we feel like we accomplished and got out of the project. So as I mentioned, one of the core centerpiece activities was a participatory climate change planning workshop. This was originally intended to be an in-person workshop, but because it took place in April 2020, we had to convert it to a virtual setting because of COVID. Um, as we'll kind of mention throughout this presentation, that actually, I think, really ended up being a very good fit for the project and what we wanted to get out of it and what we wanted to accomplish, because we were able to actually do quite a lot in this meeting. So the goals were to um, help staff learn about the best available climate change projections as they're directly relevant to river riparian and wetland habitats in Wyoming. And we focused on those habitat types because for a couple of reasons. One, because we knew we couldn't cover every single habitat type in the state to a great level of detail. So we wanted to refine our focus. And we knew that other neighboring states were particularly interested in river and riparian and wetland systems and could potentially learn from this project as well. We had sessions at the workshop where we explored the ecological consequences of climate change, and then sessions where we talked about climate informed habitat protection and restoration actions that could be relevant for inclusion in the statewide habitat plan. And then lastly, we ended the workshop with a session on you know, questions about what kinds of data or information or analyses would be helpful to the agency making future climate informed decisions. Again, the virtual setting we believe led to a pretty high level of participation. We had anywhere in any given session, anywhere from 25 to 55 staff from the Wyoming Game and Fish Department participating, as well as about a dozen outside climate change researchers. It varied by session and by day, but again, I think overall, because people were able to pop in and out as their schedules allowed, we had more larger number of people that could participate in this format. And the format was very interactive. We had a few climate science presentations to kick things off, but most of the time was spent in interactive breakout discussions where people had a lot of opportunity to contribute. And so one of the ways we facilitated those contributions was through the use of you know, online, live, editable Google Docs. 
So again, a little bit of the behind the scenes part, but we do think that this was really important to the ultimate outcome to the project. We were able to work with worksheets like this during the breakouts where coming into the meeting, Dr. Imtiaz Rangwala provided these projections and what the climate model said about what future conditions might look like in the state in four focal geographies that we focused on. And then during the workshop, experts and staff at the agency, outside experts and staff in the agency collaboratively worked together to articulate what they saw as the kind of core key ecological consequences of those changes. People could type directly into these documents, they could offer comments verbally, and we had a note taker that would document it all. It generated a lot of information that we'll talk about again over and over again in this presentation. A lot of information, way more than I've generated in typical in-person workshops with flip charts. And so that I think, you know, as we'll talk about again, led to a lot of sense of incorporation of perspectives from across the agency in this content. Ultimately, over the course of the workshop, we collaboratively produced together a list of, you know, over 75 habitat management actions that were seen as being helpful to addressing and reducing climate change impacts on river riparian and wetland systems. We ended up with over 40, around 44 statements of information that's needed to make better climate informed management decisions in the next five years. And again, a lot of content and information which you can read about in, um, there's a link to the workshop report where you can see all that we produced. So how did this information and how did this workshop activity ultimately lead to some of those goals, achieving the goals that we set out for ourselves? So I want to pivot now to going back to, this is the list of goals that I shared at the beginning of the presentation around wanting to increase the agency staff's knowledge around climate change and its impacts, incorporating climate-informed actions into the ship, identifying future gaps in information that could be the subject of future research, as well as kind of what we learned along the way from these methods. And so I want to structure the rest, we're going to structure the rest of the presentation um, using kind of, kind of going through these one at a time and sharing some results. I'll talk about the first bullet and then I'll, I'll finally get to pass it off over to Paul to talk about kind of the highlight, which was how this information actually got incorporated into the plan. And then I'll wrap up with the last two bullet points. In terms of kind of how we gauge how the project was able to support an increase in knowledge and, and familiarity with climate change information among staff at the agency, we conducted a survey of workshop participants and staff at the agency but right before the workshop and, and immediately after. And we were able to ask some questions around how what they got out of the workshop, how they benefited from the workshop and what they learned. And so I'm gonna show um, a couple of graphs that all have the same format. Um, and this is just a little piece of some of the information we got out of these surveys. But basically we asked questions like, as a result of the workshop, did you, in this case, gain new knowledge about climate change projections and impacts. We had uh, 35 staff at the Wyoming Game and Fish Department respond to the post-workshop survey. And you can see here, almost 90% of them said, yes, we gained new knowledge about climate change and its impacts as a result of the workshop. A similar number or percent reported that they felt more comfortable integrating climate change information into their work as a result of the workshop. Again, the same, same percent said they feel more familiar with approaches and tools for climate change informed conservation planning, as well as they feel more familiar with climate change adaptation strategies and actions that are relevant to their work. So, you know, taken together as a collection, we felt like that was a really resounding, you know, yes, this workshop really added value and helped us to make some real um, sort of strides in achieving that first goal around increasing knowledge and, and access and familiarity with climate change information. In terms of how the workshop was able to help the agency connect with, with additional climate change expertise in the region, we had this question about, you know, did you meet, in quotes, since we, it was a virtual setting, uh, any new individuals with whom you will likely develop or share information about climate science in the future? Um, this was the numbers are a little bit more split. There were more people who said no to this question than are the same, you know, 50 50 said yes versus no. Um, and, you know, there's a couple of reasons why I, I was thinking maybe the virtual setting led people to sort of feel like they didn't really meet people. Um, but Paul also pointed out when we were looking at this data together that because there was such high participation amongst 
staff in the department, it included people who are biologists and work regularly with other scientists, but it also included individuals who help to manage the irrigation systems on state lands that are irrigated for hay for wildlife use. So, you know, quite a large range of job descriptions and job responsibilities, some of whom maybe are less likely to be following up with climate scientists as part of their job in the future. So, um, you know, kind of an interesting to sort of think about this information, but overall we found that at least half of the people that responded to the survey said, yes, I found, you know, met some new people or know about some resources that they may not have known about going into the meeting. So again, that was, I think, really positive, especially given that we felt that this part might, I felt that this part might be a little bit limited in the virtual setting. One thing I will say about this sort of increase in knowledge, what was interesting is we found that for individuals who came into the meeting with relatively less knowledge to start, you know, so in their pre-workshop survey, they indicated they had, you know, not a lot of knowledge about climate change and its impacts coming into the meeting they actually increased the greatest amount in terms of coming out of the workshop, how much knowledge they felt they had about, or, or knowledge about impacts or familiarity with climate adaptation actions. So that was kind of interesting to think about in terms of how a workshop like this and for whom can it really add value. So now I get to turn it over to Paul to talk more again about the kind of centerpiece of how, how was the department able to pull information from this workshop and this effort and bring it into the plan. So. Our commission approved our new statewide habitat plan in late fall 2020, about a year ago, uh, November. And certainly this new plan has a strong grounding in climate science. Uh, for example, the Wildlife Conservation Society performed an analysis and noted that climate's mentioned 63 times more than, <laughs> than our last plan. And Climate considerations um, from the workshop have, have their own section in the plan, so it's certainly uh, a lot more explicit uh, this go around. Our plan has specific strategies and actions, and we flag those that um, address climate change at some level. So we have 76 actions throughout the plan, and 40% were flagged as addressing climate change. And the next slide shows an example of that. The red symbols, um, if you can make them out, are actually a fire symbol. And we use that throughout the document, but especially in this, this section to flag actions that we believe promote resiliency uh, in the face of climate change. In some cases, the actions we flagged as being relevant to climate change are things the department is already doing. For example, uh, action B on this on this particular uh, page of the document talks about emphasizing floodplain connectivity for river restoration projects, and that's something we've been doing for many years as we address and size channels and size channels being really common in the in the West. Um, but in some cases, we develop uh, identified, I should say, actions that are that are new to us. And, and again, this page provides an example under action C where um, that action focuses on the importance of, of spring creeks. And previously we'd not explicitly called out the importance of working on spring creeks, but it certainly rose in our consciousness as we batted these, these ideas around and had these conversations. And then action A is a mix of old and new perspectives. Um, Building multi-stage channels to promote resiliency in the face of droughts and floods is nothing new to us or you know, any river practitioners, but climate change forces us to think more deeply about extreme conditions of higher high flows and lower low flows. So very often what we end up doing is putting perhaps more emphasis or focus on, on actions that, that we are you know, familiar with. Another key new feature of our plan and overall approach is that now we award a point if a project proposal appears to address climate change. So under this new system, projects are awarded, uh, rewarded in scoring for addressing a specific climate change strategy or action like, a, like we just showed in that previous example, or if they 
um, identify how climate change resilience will be increased by doing the project. So by the way, this scoring is done by that same internal team of habitat and other managers, the HTAG, which I mentioned earlier. And we review project funding proposals uh, annually. So in January of 2021, last January, we did this for the first time, had mixed results. Um, our team, our HTAG team failed to provide explicit guidance and clear direction to the field. So we did not get very many applications with language uh, about how the project addressed climate change or promoted resilience. Um, frankly, this was a, a new change in our whole application process and folks frankly just missed it. So we'll address that this next go around and be more clear in that communication. Uh, on the plus side though, our team members um, were able to award climate change points to 30 out of 34 projects. And we, we didn't attempt to get um, real prescriptive or provide re really detailed guidance for team members on how to de define projects that might qualify. It was left up to their judgment. And this seemed to work, work okay. Um, we may want to provide just a little more guidance and examples uh, this next go around. One of the really valuable outcomes of this, this effort and collaboration with Molly was the generation of a, of a long list of information needs for the agency. Um, and, and I'll turn it back to Molly to, to cover that process and topic. Just before I move on to talking about the information needs work that we did, um, I do want to just kind of emphasize a couple couple things that, that, that Paul said, you know, kind of from my outside perspective, looking at the way that the agency chose to bring climate change into the plan. I do, I do really think it's notable that climate change is, is a, you know, it's integrated into an existing habitat plan. So it's not a standalone plan. It's not just like a separate annex. It's really integrated throughout and integrated into the strategies and action component of the plan. It's not just discussed as a threat, but there's actual actions that are flagged as addressing and helping to ameliorate that threat. And then the inclusion of the scoring system of climate change as one factor, or, you know, a rewarding factor, a bonus factor in that scoring system was exciting for me to see that they chose to do that, um, partly because it provides that incentive for taking up that part of the plan in actual actions on the ground. So I, for one, have been kind of, yeah, close, was, was excited to hear about how they applied it last year and looking forward to hearing how you try to, to adjust that and tweak it for next year too, Paul. So again, that was a major accomplishment to be able to actually co-produce information that could directly plug into the plan. And then, as I mentioned, you know, one of our other goals for the project was to say, looking ahead to future research, how could we articulate some key information needs for the agency that could be the subject of future research? And as we mentioned earlier, coming out of the workshop, and we had a very fruitful discussion on, you know, what does the agency need to know in order to make better climate informed decisions in the coming five years, just a kind of random amount of time we've selected, but sort of like not just right away, but in the, in the coming years. And we got over 44 statements of information needs that relate to all kinds of themes around understanding climate change impacts on riparian and wetland systems or the effectiveness of strategies and actions like beaver restoration and, and other kinds of process-based restoration approaches and, and so on. And so this was again, <clears throat> An example of the workshop generating a lot of information. Um, however, to say you have a long list of 44 information needs doesn't necessarily help to guide or help prioritize. Say, if you have some research funding, what should you put it towards? So we decided as a, as a group to go another step further to try to help refine our understanding of these needs and to, you know, some form of prioritizing them a little bit more. And we chose to do this through an online survey that we sent to all Wyoming Game and Fish Department staff. So not just those who attended the workshop, but all staff. And um, I, I believe we had something like 25, maybe 28 people respond, some of whom had attended the workshop, but some of whom hadn't. And they provided us with um, a wealth of information about for each of those 44 statements of information need, we asked this question, indicate how useful is this information need to your ability to consider the effects of climate change 
in your work on river riparian and wetland habitats. So for every single one of those 44, we got information on whether uh, managers felt it was very useful to not at all useful to their work. So from those results, this is one of those classic slides where I tell you, don't try to read all the words on this slide. It's mostly just to convey that we got a lot of, we keep getting a lot of information as part of this project. But this was a really interesting piece of a bit of information that we received for every single one of those 44 statements of information need, we, we got a sense for you know, what percentage of the responding managers felt they were very useful to their work or less useful to their work. One thing to note is that every single one of those 44 statements had at least one manager respond saying that filling that gap would be very useful to my work. However, some were seen as being more useful to more people. So we were able to use this information from the survey to refine that list of 44 a little bit further and allow us to pull out things like what we call here, this is what we call the tier one information needs. Those that were seen as useful or very useful to over 60% of survey respondents. And so this gets us to a list of eight information needs related to, again, a number of different themes around hydrology or the effectiveness of process-based restoration approaches or how to think about water management and trade-offs. Um, so, you know, where you draw the line and decide that these are the tier one or these are the highest priority is sort of up to the agency and thinking about, but it at least starts to flag some topics as being broadly of interest to a large number of managers in the agency. And so internally, the idea is the agency can use this information for when they have funding for research projects to help them think about some topics they might want to focus on. We also hope that this information, which is in our workshop report, can also be helpful for outside researchers, scientists who want to do management relevant science, but aren't sure what questions managers are most interested in. This starts to give some indications of, at least for the Wyoming Game and Fish Department, what are some research questions that can directly relate to their work and could be a foundation for starting up some conversations with the department about how, how they might collaborate or at least help to inform a research project that wants to be management relevant. Okay, so this brings us to the last part of the presentation where I just wanna share a little bit about, again, kind of what we learned about the methods we used and in particular, what seemed to work particularly well from this project in case it's useful for others that, like, that are interested in doing this kind of work or are doing this kind of work in other places. So I already mentioned the workshop surveys. Those obviously give us some indication of the value of the workshop and, and the benefits that that um, activity or that method um, provided to the, to the project. But I'm gonna focus here on sharing some of the results from our post project or kind of end of the project interviews. Uh, two colleagues, two social scientists at WCS, colleagues of mine who were not intimately involved in the research and project, or sorry, the project activities, conducted these interviews with Paul and his other colleagues on that core team at the agency who were, you know, I worked with sort of throughout the project. Um, and they also interviewed me as well to kind of hear some of our perceptions about the project methods, their usefulness, their replicability, and so on. Through those conversations, one thing that jumped out was the benefit that having a position like a, a person like myself, what we call what some of us call a boundary actor, somebody who's kind of in between the research community and the management decision making community and understands a little bit about both of those worlds, that having somebody like myself in that role as a boundary actor was very beneficial to the project. And so we'll talk a little bit about what about having the, you know my role in the project was helpful. And I'll just acknowledge that this is the part that's a little bit awkward for me to present because I'm going to share a little bit about you know my role and how it was helpful to the project, but I'm just going to acknowledge that it's a little awkward and just move on and share what we heard. <laughs> so in terms of feedback from the, again, core team at the agency about the process and methods, they reported that the overall way we work together, the process we use provided lots of opportunities for them to provide input into the project design and to tailor our activities to meet their desired outcomes. As we alluded to earlier, we really all agreed that the workshop format was very effective. Even though we had to convert to virtual and we were maybe a little bit disappointed about that at first, I think it really ended up being a boon to this project. Participation was very strong 
And using the shared interactive Google Docs encouraged inclusivity. So a lot of staff in the department had a chance to contribute ideas and content to this material. And, gener and, and again, it generated a lot of information. So it was just a very great way to, to engage a lot of people in the department and to gather a lot of information that provided a lot of fodder for the planning process. Staff at the department you know, emphasized that being able to work with climate experts that were very locally knowledgeable and to look at climate data that was tailored specifically to the state and to the habitat types that we were discussing made the impact more tangible and promoted even better, again, engagement in the discussion and made that the sort of climate change discussion very practical and relevant to their work. Um, and we all found that sort of the approach we used to sort of filter that long list of information needs to some relatively higher priority ones was really effective and got to some very useful information. Overall, um, staff at the department felt like this should, you know, this was a pretty replicable process. The activities we used are things that others could potentially pick up and use um, for their purposes as well. But this sometimes came with the caveat of, especially when there's the support of somebody playing this kind of boundary actor role. So in terms of some specifics that came out about the boundary actor and, and, and what role um, I was able to add to the process, one was just flat out the time commitment. You know, being able to engage in the process over time, it's not like I came in and just facilitated the workshop and then pulled out, but was able to be there and be supportive of the rest of the, the hard work of figuring out how do we make sense of the workshop material and incorporate it into the plan. Uh, I was able to bring to the table some ideas on methods, so specific ways to engage staff with the workshop and how to design the surveys to get further input, and then partly helping to drive the process. You know, sometimes you just need somebody who's like, okay, when's the next meeting? Let's talk again in two weeks. Let's keep it going. Um, asking the right questions to kind of keep our ideas moving along. Um, but, you know, not like dictating what that schedule is going to be, not dictating it, but involving everybody in the process along the way. And then again, being able to spend that time, you know, put in some of the hard work to help the team process the information, all that information that came out of the workshop, and then, you know, make some sense of it as it relates to the plan. Um, and then again, having some relevant topical expertise and knowledge and knowledge of other relevant experts that has local very applicable knowledge and information to offer was seen as valuable to the project. And then just, I wanna complement that with kind of my own perspective, which is to say, I appreciated that they felt that having me there was really helpful to the project, but I would emphasize that it's not sufficient. You know, it's not that I was an outside consultant to ask to, to, ask to do an analysis or provide a product that then, you know, handed off to the agency, but the agency really, put a lot of time and engagement into this project. We worked very closely together for many hours over the course of the year. And I think that's what really led to the successful outcome. It wasn't me suggesting or God forbid telling the agency, this is how you ought to bring climate change into your plan. I was really helping to kind of synthesize the information, but ultimately Paul and his team at the agency, they chose how they wanted this to be represented in the plan. They made those decisions about how to pull it into the plan. And I think that just resulted in a product on which, around which there was a lot of support and buy-in and involvement on the part of the department. So I appreciated that they felt I had, as a boundary actor, an important role to play, but it really is um, kind of needs also that engagement, I think personally I'd say from the agency side to be successful too. So with that, we'll wrap it up and finally turn it over to see if we have a little bit of time for questions. Um, you know, obviously there are a lot of other state agencies like Wyoming Game and Fish Department who, who support science-based management decision-making and are interested in incorporating climate change, but who also may not necessarily know exactly how to get started or, or how to bring it into a particular planning process. Um, we hope that our project offers some insight into some real practical ways to get started and move forward on it. Um, despite some of the challenges. So again, when we found the workshop was a really uh, feasible and practical and effective way to get input from a lot of people. Um, it provided that opportunity for participation as well as the gathering of a lot of information. Um, and again, for others interested in this work, I think you know, we would all agree that having somebody being able to play a boundary actor type role, engaging with additional regional experts can help support the agency 
fill critical knowledge gaps that the agency may not have in-house, and overall hopefully lead to a more um, well-informed kind of process and project. And then I'll just wrap up with uh, really, really the words of, of, from Paul when we were talking about some key take-home messages that obviously a plan is only useful when it's actually used. It's exciting to hear that they used the plan just this past year and continue to plan to use it. Um, but, you know, of course, we all need to keep our foot on the gas, if you will, to really make sure that climate change becomes, you know, part of the many issues we all consider in thinking about natural resource management decision making. So that hopefully, you know, we're thinking about the most effective investments we can over time. And I'll just uh, pull up the last slide. I'll say thank you very much. Turn it over, open it up for questions. Um, here's a link to the, to the plan if you want to see more about how the agency brought the information into the final plan or the updated version of the plan, link to our workshop report, and of course, acknowledge the many teams of people who, who participated in and contributed to this effort from inside the agency and out. All right, Molly, Paul, there's a question in the chat um, from Scott Larson who asks, beyond specific actions, climate change topics, or information needs, are steps in place to continue to strengthen and expand new relationships between the Wyoming um, Department of Game and Fish and the North Central CASC into the future in the long run? You know, the, um, the CASC hasn't been shy about reaching out to, uh, to contact us periodically in the states in general in the West about information needs. So I, you know, I'd be surprised if we, we didn't hear. We don't really have a, a plan in place per se. Um, that's, that's an interesting question, but I'm, I'm confident we're, you know, we'll be continuing to communicate uh, through time. Yeah, I would say, you know, in terms of, so as Paul mentioned, this plan was approved by the Wyoming Game and Fish Commission um, a year ago. And I would say over the course of this past year, some of the ways we've continued to sort of work together or stay in touch is, of course, through sharing the project through venues like this, but also, um, you know, as I learn about projects that are doing research, especially related to some of those high priority information needs. I often reach out to Paul and ask if there's colleagues at the department who might want to be connected to those researchers or when there's funding calls, funding opportunities from the North Central CASC. Um, you know, I've been trying to help kind of play a little bit of a matchmaker role if, if it's useful and relevant to the agency. And so I think we have some kind of informal ways that we've been continuing to work together, not necessarily, as Paul said, kind of formal plans, but you know, again, the hope is that uh, we've forged at least some connections and relationships, not just with myself, but also with, you know, some of the other folks who participated in the workshop that the agency can tap into as things come up. Hi, Kim. Hey, Molly. Uh, thanks both for the talk. This was really relevant for what I'm working on, so I found it really helpful. Um, I was just curious, you talked a little bit about, um, Molly, your role as a boundary actor um, after the workshop. I was just curious how you kind of move that process forward after the workshop. And if you feel like you're mostly leading that on yourself based on what you learned from the workshop, or were you still getting feedback from Game and Fish throughout that process? And just kind of curious how you went about that. If you were nervous about taking too much of their time or you feel like it was just a natural fit between the team. Yeah, it's a great question. I can share my perspectives and Paul, you could chime in as well from your side of it. Um, like I said, it was very clear that, that the, this core team, at least, I mean, again, we had, you know, 25 to 55 staff participate in the workshop, but there was a core team of six who, you know, we continued to work together after the workshop on a variety of different pieces. And it was just very clear right from the start, this was a high priority for them. Obviously, they had a specific timeline for updating the plan. So they had some of their own internal deadlines and need to keep things moving. But they had that commitment to bringing climate change in, and they committed to the extra work involved in doing so. It was definitely more work on their part to bring climate change into the plan. Uh, at least I see it, you know, from my perspective, my, my assumption is it was more work and to, in order to do that, and they made that commitment. So I never, it wasn't, you know, me nagging them, like, let's get on the calendar. We, we would have a call, and at the end, we'd all be like, okay, when's our next call? Let's, it probably should be two weeks because we want to keep this moving. It was um, very neutral. Paul, would you, what would you say? Yeah, you just said all the words I was going to say, so I don't know what to add to that. Um, you know, it's fairly natural. Uh, we, we, we did have a kind of a target 
date of you know November December of of last year, and so when you dial back a schedule based off of that, and you need to get reports done and, and and the pieces put together, it you know felt like a joint responsibility, and um, and so it was pretty natural to to pick meeting times and dates and and you know with a with a core team of of a half a dozen or so folks, if if one or two people can't make that, the rest sort of charge on and. Uh, so, so it, it worked out really well that way. Okay, yeah, thanks for the feedback. So I All see right. a question from, um, yeah, from Charles Rimmel asking about, what do you suggest that in the best next step to see some of those 30 actions addressing climate change implemented on the ground with more projects? And in particular, I know Charles, you're at the Greater Yellowstone Coalition. How can the NGO community support this work? I'll maybe pass that over to you, Paul, just you know, specific to the plan and thinking about how you work with partners. Right. Yeah. So, you know, I think I think it comes down to leadership and and kind of putting the or keeping the foot on the gas, so to speak. Um, it, 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 at least I can speak for my role on on our internal team. You know, we um, we're going to continue to um, meet frequently. You know, like every couple of months, I guess, is, is sort of our standard meeting times, but we shine a light on actions, I guess. We, we've taken a, adopted a practice of talking about some of them at basically every, every get together, every time we sit down together. And, um, and by talking about them, we, we sort of bring them to the fore and um, you know, distribute those notes, talk to each of the, each of the biologists in our particular regions um, to sort of keep them active and keep them in front of people, um, and then, and then sort of from the from the ground up, from the biologist perspective, um, when they're working with partners and folks from the NGO community, um, we want we want folks to always be sort of putting their kind of climate change glasses on as they're looking at efforts and projects to see and anticipate um, how might this look differently, you know, given given you know, more variability and changes coming. And, um, um, you know, we, we feel like we have a really strong collaborative community working with NGOs in different parts of the state already. And, um, and, 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 and so I, I don't know how to add to that, but um, be willing to contemplate alternative approaches, I guess. Thanks, Paul and Molly, I appreciate Appreciate that, and I really appreciate the work that went into this workshop. Um, and I've read through the ship; it's an awesome resource. And yeah, I relate to the point of my question. Um, representing Greater Yellowstone Coalition, we just want to support the implementation of this work as much as possible. Um, and so, part of it, part of my question, wonders about like, is it best to work with you, um, you know, kind of from the top out of the Cheyenne office, or is it better to start with um, managers and biologists on the ground um, within the different regions, or or both. Yeah, I'm generally a generally a uh, all of the above sort of uh, approach um, by default. And so, um, if if we can kind of talk general themes and, and overall emphases at the same time, um, local biologists and, and NGO representatives are. Are really talking practical uh, projects, I think um, I think we might have the most bang for the buck. Yeah, it'll be interesting over time to, you know, Paul, when you um, showed that slide and talked through the slide where we had that kind of screenshot from the plan and showed how some are highlighted as being related to climate change. But even across those, it spans from actions that the agency probably already does a fair amount of work on that was always been part of the plan and some things that are maybe newer. And it will be interesting, maybe we could sort of work to track over time as you do use the plan and use it for your annual funding cycles, at least from those, that portfolio of projects you decide to fund each year, kind of look at which strategies and actions they're addressing and are there any gaps? You know, so for example, the protection of spring systems maybe is, you know, maybe with something that's maybe a little bit newer to the plan or not as common in what the agency is already investing in, maybe you'll see that those actions get a little bit less attention than the others because 
it's easier to continue doing work you're already doing rather than starting up new things. And so it could be interesting over time to look at whether there are certain actions that are flagged in the plan, but maybe not the subject of as many projects on the ground, at least in the first few years, and then use that to maybe communicate about areas to, to, to either get partners to focus on or. Yeah. Or no, totally. Yeah, that's something. a great idea. And then even that example you cite, the Spring Creek one, um, that one's especially germane to the northwest part of Wyoming and the Greater Yellowstone Coalition uh, that Charles Charles is representing. And so, you know, that you just put your finger on it, happen to put your finger on an example, that would be a really good fit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, maybe, uh, maybe after this call, Paul, you and I can take a look at that list of what was it 30 projects or so that you did flag as being related to climate change and see which which strategies and actions did address those those projects addressed from the plan i think paul pride is the question about it, to what extent do you guys engage with the tribal fish and wildlife agencies in the state and i'll just say for for this project it was an internal process primarily with some outside climate experts so my primarily focused on the wyoming state agency but paul you could speak more to your work outside yeah. of just the project we did right yeah there's there's a lot of on tap potential for working more closely with uh, with the tribes in Wyoming. We work with the Fish and Wildlife Service, sort of, um, you know, as as almost a proxy, I guess, um, for for that work, and especially in the realm of fish passage. We, and we work some with the tribes on fish passage, which is a huge, you know, climate change resiliency um, um, action. Uh, but there's there's definitely uh, quite a bit of room for uh, for more of that. Well, thank you again to Molly and Paul for this wonderful presentation and um, everyone who participated. Yeah, thanks so much, everybody, for joining. Feel free to contact certainly me. I won't I won't speak for Paul, but he may not want to get as many calls. But <laughs> please oh, feel you can free to reach me. out if you want to. If you want to contact learn more about the great. project, we'd be thank happy you. to talk.